Yeah, so today is future day, but we decided what we would do for future day is whatever Rich does in this session. <laughs> so whatever it is, that's our future day celebration. You may be aware of the comical constriction of the number of places doing future day. When I started participating, there were 18 cities and then 12. And now I think it's just Melbourne and Edmonton. There are two events in Melbourne and one in Edmonton. And yeah, so, so it's not um, a terribly successful holiday. If you didn't realize today was a holiday, <laughs> then that's what most people think. They didn't realize that either. Yeah. Okay, Rich, you can take it away. Welcome. We're very pleased to have you here. Well, thank you, Kim. Um, I think it may be just fine that we um, uh, are just a few. Yeah. Um, that means we can get to know each other, have a full conversation. Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. So, but but you guys, um, Jessica and Cody, Aretha, and Miss Bath, I'm pronouncing it. Okay, uh, yeah, come be present. Come turn on your cameras if you, if you don't mind, so we can uh, all be here. Um, I would actually like to, to, uh, <laughs> hey, hey, yeah, yeah. Miss Pa, yeah. Uh, so I'll start. I think we should tell each other about ourselves. So I'm I'm a uh, I'm really more than anything. Uh, I'm a, a researcher in AI, and I've been studying that for a long time. Um, and but I'm also uh, interested in. Of course, AI makes me interested in the future because AI is amazingly going to happen in the future. Um, but I'm a student uh, observer of the human condition and trying to think like many of us are, where we're going and whether, how we can make it, how we can improve our odds of it's being a good outcome. And so I've thought a lot about, you know, the economy and, and the systems that we live in. And so I, what are we doing today? I, I see it's an opportunity uh, um, for us to talk about that. I, I see that's what this course is about. Um, but I, I wanna put Kim on the spot for just a second and ask him, you know, do we have a official statement of what this course is about? Um, so it's, what's this it's supposed to be about the technological singularity um, made accessible to everyone. In other words, you don't have to read 17 books before you can understand what it is. It's, it's much simpler than that. And, and we're trying to, to explain it in a way that everybody can, can un understand this idea that eventually machines will be smarter than we are and take over the future agenda of the world. And that we may be collaborating with them or they may actually be kind of inside us if we have implants so we, we can fully participate in that machine supremacy when it when it occurs. And of course, medicine writ large is another part of this. I think of medicine as something very big that also includes like the social responsibility of medicine, the physician as the natural attorney of the poor and poverty and injustice being the background for a lot of medical illness. So if we could solve these big problems in society, we would naturally solve a lot of medical stuff. And then we, we, we have this CIFAR grant where we've taken the big 13 challenges of the human race and claiming that AI can assist in some way with all 13 of those. The evidence for that was um, protein folding, that protein folding is much more complicated 
than any of those big problems of uh, humanity. But of course, now it's nuclear fusion because that's the latest thing that, that, that AI has helped to solve. So it, it seems that, the, that if you focus AI on any complicated problem, it can probably solve it. And that's very exciting, gives us hope for the future. Yeah, so that's my thinking. Good. Uh, so I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to simplify that. I think simplification is is um, not something to apologize for. It's, simplification is something that we do all the time, and uh, it's really necessary. And I, as a as someone who studies how the mind works, accept that we everyone has to simplify, and that when we design intelligent agents, even however complicated we're going to make them, however Moore's law and however many. Um, GPUs they use, they're going to have to get us. The world is still vastly more complicated. People are more complicated. People are in the world. And so we have to, simplifying models is, is, is a bit of our foundation of thinking. So uh, so, so I, I want to give a little bit of my philosophy. Um, now that we've established. Um, so let me share my screen, just show you some notes I took earlier today. I can figure out, um, share a screen, Let's share the screen. Uh, yep, and, it's coming. Yeah, good, yeah. good. I, I just out of curiosity, do you, you guys see, um, the uh, my notes and you see the stuff in the background. Do you yes. guys see uh, faces here? Fa fa we don't see faces. no faces here. No. Okay. Cool. Uh, do you see? Uh, do you see Kim? Do you see me? Well, that that's see my a screen? setting. So, like they they can set it on uh, gallery. Okay. Well, I'm going to over here. See us all. You can see me. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. We can. We can. Okay, so and we, I can see some yeah. of you guys. Cool. All right. So, um, okay. yeah, yeah. My philosophy, I call it multiple perspectivism, and it just says that it's good to have multiple ways of thinking about things, and they don't have to be entirely consistent with each other. And really, as you go through life, you should collect lots of different perspectives, and, and, and you should assess each one for utility. But you sh shouldn't be overly fixated on uh, consistency between the perspectives. Each perspective should be internally coherent. Okay, and then th this leads to the idea that you understand everything at, at multiple levels. So most interesting phenomena can be understood at, at multiple levels. And by level of understanding, I just mean it's a perspective on some phenomena that's useful and coherent, but not necessarily consistent with the other perspectives and the other levels of analysis. Okay, but that being said, the best levels are more or less um, separable from the others. So a level that tells you, so some examples, um, uh, you might have a perspective on, on uh, the, the world that it's made up of atoms and particles and stuff, you know, like a, a simple object, it's a bunch of atoms, but you might also have the perspective that this is a container for water that you could drink from. And those are two different perspectives, and they're 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 uh, they may be consistent with each other, but they're they're so, they're almost entirely separate from each other. You know, my my understanding of what it means to drink and water is quite separate from my understanding about about forces and, and atoms. And so this is good. Um, and then so we might we ask. Uh, our, our basic level of understanding of, of, of everything, of the universe, um, then there are some obvious ways of understanding the universe. Um, level one, you might say it's, you know, the, the world of physics and all the particles and the forces and the atoms and, the, and, the, and, and so forth. Um, and that's, that is an understanding of everything, right? Because everything is such particles and um, everything is made of atoms. And like you are made of atoms, I am made of atoms. Uh, but we know that just the atomic level description doesn't say everything there is to say about it. Um, 
So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a level. And the next level would be to talk about biology and evolution and how different there are different organisms and they would each have DNA and, um, and then, you know, ways of, of life gives, gives rise to things that persist uh, or, or don't persist. And, you know, evolution really is a more general concept. It isn't just about DNA. It's, it's about the, the, the fact that, that things that, 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 that can continue tend to be around for a long time. And so the species that, that are most successful uh, supporting themselves tend to stay around for a long time. And that's a level of analysis. And it, it does depend on the underlying physics, but it, you, you, you talk about it and you analyze it, you think about it separately from that. And then a third level is the level that I actually study in my re research, which is the level of intelligence and minds, which is, uh, you know, it could be separate from biology and evolution, which could, for example, just tell us about uh, plants and bacteria and things which have the best simple minds, whereas, uh, we like to think of individual agents, individual minds with goals and actions and perceptions. And that's what the singularity is about. It's about our machines starting to have these, these abilities. And you know, just notice that, that level, that level of thinking about intelligence, thinking about an individual interacting with his environment, achieving his goals, perceiving things, um, that level uh, is independent uh, of physics. And although it builds on, it, it, it presumably has an underlying physical substrate, it's still largely independent. And it's also separate from the biology because you could be an intelligence if you have a mind, even if you're not part of biology, you're not part of evolution. Yeah, so this level of minds is, is my focus, um, but I'm also interested in, in the next levels. Um, so the next level up would be the economy. And this gives us a special way of thinking about the economy. Um, the economy being is how we specialize and, and interact with one another. Um, now I think the most important thing about people is that we are cooperative. We are the, the cooperative animal. And so we can work together, we can uh, specialize and then exchange uh, services and goods with each other. And this gets us the economy. And this gets us a way of cooperating beyond our individual goal. So, so the idea coming from level three is that we each have individual goals. Like I'm trying to, to raise my family and I'm trying to get food into my body. And, um, and you may be trying to get food for yourself and or, or food for your family, your friends. So we all have really goals that they, oh, they, they're sort of symmetrical. Like we all want food, but, you know, my getting food and you getting food is, is are different things. And so I, I, at the base level, we all have different goals and yet we uh, are highly cooperative. Um, and that cooperativity uh, is not part of level two, level three is part of, it's, it's an observation at level four. At level three, we are just sitting there with different goals and pursuing our different goals. And uh, we might even be individuals, not in a society, or we may, or we may be in a society, but we're, but we're still pursuing our individual goals. Okay, so this is, and maybe, maybe it's an extreme view, uh, but I know it's, a, it's a really clear view is that intelligence is about things that have goals and their goals are their goals. They're, they're not universal goals or goals held by other agents necessarily. Some, some, like if you, we, our goals may coincide. Maybe you um, want to make U of A uh, a more um, widely recognized independent uh, university, a more widely known university and I may work towards that and Kim may work towards that and when you go home and, and talk to your, your your friends and family you may you may also you know want, want want share parts of that goal okay so people can share goals um, but but uh, they're basically different goals and that that's okay I, 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 I want us to own this idea that it's okay that we have our own goals, um, you know, it, which is to say that I feel there's a pressure, uh, a societal pressure, it'd be something at the at, at, at level um, four, five. Level five is a mystery to me, okay? 
level five is the above the level of individuals interacting voluntarily to achieve their cooperative goals. Um, so things above that, well, I'm not sure what they are. I'm not sure if they're good or bad, but if we talk about society and morality and government and social goods and social goals, uh, then we have this other level, which is both good and bad. It has politicians and, and con men and manipulative priests and thieves um, where we try to uh, tell other people what they want or what they should do. Um, so this is this uh, this upper level is, I think, um, what we're trying to think about. We're trying to think about what's uh, what's good. How we can is there something above level four, which is we are individual agents, um, but we are in a, a, a multi-agent situation and we can cooperate or we could conflict. And, and when we introduce AI, the singularity, we, we could introduce more participants. Uh, we are trying to create level three agents, minds that have get goals and actions and perceptions. And do we want to, uh, how are we going to integrate them into our economy and our society so that it, it comes out well? So this is the way I'm thinking about the topic, okay? Um, and I guess also saying my perspective is that I am, I am very suspicious of level five. I think, you know, collective action is maybe can do some good things, um, certainly we need collective action in terms of enforcing standards like we don't want to be stealing from each other or, or murdering each other. We need that, we need certain norms uh, in order to cooperate well, voluntarily cooperate well. Um, but when, if we, as we go beyond that, you know, that's how we get with by having super, larger collective organizations is how we get wars. It maybe is also how we, we uh, achieve uh, a society that, that works very well together. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested in this level of five and how we should think about it and how we should continue to think about it as, we, as the singularity comes. Okay, so this, this is what I see is what is our real, real question. And I, I want, I don't know if you notice this, I hope, I hope it's clear that I'm phrasing it in a particular way, way as if, uh, we start out as agents which have individual goals, so we could call them, uh, tempted to call them selfish goals, but the whole point is that all goals are selfish. They're, they're, they're the goals that we have. You know, even if I, my goal is, is for you to live, uh, have a good life, um, I'm, I'm exerting pressure on your life if I pursue that goal. And so I'm, I'm, I'm choosing something for you, choosing something even if you don't want it, so whatever my goal is, if it's, it's all goals are selfish. All goals are individual. And, and then we can, we, if that is the case, if we are a society that's full of individual agents with various goals, what would, what would, what would then happen? Imagine, I mean, take yourself, separate yourself from me, what you know about your real society. Just ask yourself in some imaginary case, if you have a bunch of agents, thousands, millions of agents, all with different goals, um, what, would they, what would they do? That they can talk to each other, they're, 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 they will interact with each other. Um, I, I, I think it's just clear that what will, will happen is, is they will look for cases where they agree, right? If, if, they, if we agree about a goal, like you're trying to do A and I'm trying, also trying to do A, and we could get we should, we should get together and and promote each other because promoting the other helps helps me. Each one helps the other. So there would be a big fixation with what goals are in common, and and so and also so we might just, uh, you and me are both interested in A, but if we get a sufficiently generic goal, we might we might be able to agree on on lots of people. Like maybe we can all agree. Um, we shouldn't murder each other. 
okay? Um, and we can make a rule and uh, because we all agree on that, we, we have a common uh, goal, okay? And so another thing that could happen is you might have a goal and I might have a goal and then I might try to persuade you that your goal is actually mine. If I can talk you into that, then you will work towards my goal. Okay. Um, and of course the economy does this. Like I'm trying to uh, do something like make widgets and I might hire you to, for you to help me make widgets. Okay. And so that's not, that's different. That's the economy. That's kind of like level three, level four, exchange, specialization. You, you specialize in something and then we exchange something so that we both win, sort of win-win exchanges. And um, whereas if I, if I manipulate you to persuade you that your goal is really something, um, then I will, uh, uh, then you know, that's sort of like a bad form of interaction. And so what we see in society today is exactly, in my opinion, exactly this. People are arguing over, over, over values and uh, which means what the goals should be. And um, the, the, the form of, of the arguments are, are very often not, um, well, there, there, are, there are of the form that you should want this. You should want something. And um, I, I do want to propose that that's, that's uh, an invalid form of argument. There is no should when it comes to um, goals. Your goals are whatever your goals are. Your goal may be uh, consistent or inco inconsistent with other people's goals. So if your goal is inconsistent with my goal, I might say your goal is bad. But I just mean, I don't agree with it and I'm going to oppose it, okay? And then, when, that, when we say uh, everyone should want something, you know, that's just weird. You might say everyone does want something, like maybe everyone wants clean water, okay? But um, that would be a fact about what goals we happen to have, and it's not a should. If some, if some person could have a goal that is actually opposed to all the rest, but it's, it's still a valid goal, um, you know, the only thing you'd say about it is it is opposed to everyone else's. Okay, it's uh, and so that's 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 the land I think we should be in. We should be in the land of saying, oh, these goals um, are are compatible with each other. We can work together. These goals are incompatible. We should find a way that we don't uh, that, that incompatibility doesn't cause too much trouble, and um, and that there's no should about goals. So when you, when, when you design AI agents like I do, it's really clear we have to give them goals and the goals are arbitrary. Um, there are no shoulds about it. If we have some, some higher level objective for a system of agents, then there might be a should about what, what, uh, what choices a designer could, what goals a designer should assign to the individual agents. But there isn't a choice um, about what an agent's goal should be. The agent doesn't have a choice about that. And the designer doesn't have a choice about what the designer's goals are. It's just a misunderstanding of, of goal and means and ends. The means are a means to an end and the end. means can be uh, appropriate or inappropriate, effective or ineffective, but the ends are just ends. Okay, so, um, yeah, this, I was hoping we could now have a discussion about, about ethics in light of this point of view. Uh, remember the first point that, you know, multiple perspectives are good. I'm trying to give you a different perspective. And I, I would like to, you know, kind of bounce it across, bounce it uh, up against your perspectives. So uh, please react. So this picture 
is a depiction of the basic goodness of human beings. And I mean, one idea about the future is- Let's that stop when, right there. Let's stop right there. Yeah. The basic goodness of human beings. Right. Which, which I'm what, thinking, How does that fit in? Yes. It, I, I think that doesn't fit with what you've said, but I want to tell you why the idea exists because we think that when uh, AI is smarter than we are, they will have a decision to make about whether to accommodate human needs and wants on the earth or not. And there has to be a basis for deciding that. And so one basis. Stop, let's stop yeah. there. Let's stop there. And let's. Right. So why have, have we already had to make that decision many times? Like there, there are other beings on this earth, the animals, and uh, we, we, have, we have to decide whether to share. Right. Well, we have to make that decision. Right. Um, and we have there are other peoples in the world and you know, a typical human reaction is that other people don't count. Like I, I grew up in the United States and, and you know, people being influenced or having outcomes across the world, it doesn't matter if there's a strong bias for outcomes to Americans are different than outcomes to any other people. And so that's, that's kind of maybe it's part of the American ethic. I think it's also part of the ethic of all of ours of all peoples, all peoples uh, prioritize them, their own people more than others. And um, um, so we don't, is, yeah. so are all the basic goodness of all people. So my interpretation of that is that, that we're all happy interacting and cooperating. Cooperation is, is, a, is, is a, what you might mean by the basic goodness, that we're all willing to cooperate. And you know, as long as you're coming out all right, you're happy for me to come out all right. And maybe you're even happier if I come out better than, than, than otherwise. Uh, it's the nature of cooperation. Um, and just, so let's just notice, let's talk a little about cooperation a little bit. Uh, or let me talk about it. Um, sure. Cooperation. What do you need for cooperation? Well, you, a language is like really useful because then you can say, you can make a deal. You do this for me, and I'll do that for you, and you can be held to it um, by your reputation. Um, also, really good is is you know to have a means of exchange so that we don't have to do barter, and that is really what money is. And, and property, uh, even before. For money, I guess the notion of property should arise. Property is, is how we say, well, I'm not going to, you can live over there, I'll live over here, and I'll, I'll, I'll respect your territory or your property, and, and, and you can respect mine. So we can agree, and we can cooperate. So all this is part of cooperation. And if you look at our huge um, productivity of our world, uh, our economy, uh, and all of the goods and, and and services and education and knowledge in our world. And it's all come about by people specializing and people exchanging. And we have to uh, recognize that. It doesn't come really from, uh, really from collective action. Anyway, it comes from people trading to their, achieve their own goals and being more effective together than they are separately. And so the basic goodness of people is that most people will re recognize that this is a vastly superior way to be, okay? And at least that's what I'm suggesting. And it, if, if that's correct, it's quite pertinent to our, our discussion about the singularity and about the arrival of intelligent agents that are um, mechanical rather than biological. And, and those, if, what I'm proposing is that the reason why we cooperate has nothing to do with our biology, it has, has little to do with our bio biology and little to do with our humanity, but just 
just because we are goal seeking systems that have goals and we live in a society of other goal seeking systems and just much more effective to exchange, to specialize in exchange than it is to try to do everything yourself. So the so it's not the basic goodness of, of human being. It's just it's just yeah. it's just enlightenment. If you're enlightened, you realize that you'll do you'll do much better, whatever your goal is, almost whatever your goal is, uh, by cooperating with others, even if those others have different goals. Right. So the intent isn't that Rich and I would do all all the talking. I think we should hear <laughs> from some, some of the rest of you here. Uh, so let's let's make it uh, an assignment. I mean, if you could, if you don't mind, let's just hear um, how you're approaching the question of, of the singularity and how we we uh, carry out our responsibility to to know about the the ethics of our medicine and uh, interact with with patients. So let's start with Aria. Uh, if you could just say a little bit about, about your perspective. Um, I think a like how we're approaching the singularity. I think a lot of me approaching the singularity in this course is just like getting myself more familiar with it. Like I haven't, I don't know much about the singularity going into this course. A lot of me in this course has been me trying to like learn more about it and just figure out what like it means. Um, I think when like looking at it in terms of like medicine and healthcare, um, I think an important thing is seeing like, I guess the good and the bad technology can do. And obviously that's subjective depending on who's looking at it, but just seeing um, how it can be really helpful in healthcare and medicine and how some people also might be um, not be like um, super comfortable with technology and medicine. And I think the main thing for me has been um, just trying to uh, understand different perspectives, because I think that's important when we're looking at the singularity, seeing how different people look at it and kind of seeing how um, a lot of society might view the singularity. Thank you. So one phenomenon in this version of the course, Rich, is we have two families and Today we have one of them. So these two people with 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 the same last name are sisters. So, anyway, so. oh yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so well, <Yeah>. sister Mispa. <laughs> um. Yeah. So I think yeah. Like I would agree. Like going into this course, I didn't really know to be honest, like much about AI and like um just like anything related to the singularity in general but uh even with like the points that you had said about like the different levels i think that that's kind of fascinating like to kind of try to place like where even ai would fit into something like that because do we like how do we understand it at a very basic level of like what is like the involved in like creating something like that and like the technology that goes into it um and then like the impacts of it at like level five of like society and like could there at one point be a society where we only see it in terms of like ai and technology um, integrated with like humans and like them as their own like rational thought. Um, so yeah, I kind of like what you said. So yeah, it's cool. Thank you, Ms. Pa. Let's just keep going through the through the folks. Uh, Jessica, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Okay, good. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm also in the same boat. Like I had actually never even heard the term singularity before this course, so I had no idea what it was. Um, but I actually do like a fair amount of research in AI um, and diagnostic imaging. So like I was like I've been exposed to AI itself, but had never really thought about what it means for the future, especially of, of medicine, aside from like improving little aspects, but I never really thought of it past the point where it's just like, a helpful little tool for everyday practice so I don't know I'm like I'm just kind of like listening and learning and taking it all in like I don't have any like like radical ideas or anything to share but I think it's quite interesting thank you Jessica 
and Cody, are you able to speak to us? No, we can't hear you yet. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, there you are. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I've just been having some troubles with my mic and camera lately. But um, yeah, I can kind of just echo what Jessica said. Like, I'd heard a lot about like AI being used in medicine, like, like in radiology and like, you know, it's almost always talked about in kind of a bad way too, like replacing people's jobs and things like that. But uh, I had never really thought about it too much until this course. And yeah, I'm just kind of trying to take it all in and process it all. Good. Now you guys have heard about the basics of AI, I'm presuming, I guess, from other, yes. um, other speakers. Uh, we, you've covered about neural networks and about mm -hmm. um, Atari game playing and, and Go. Have you, how far have you guys come on all those things? Yeah, I think we, we, we've we had uh, three lectures from Osmar and then one Good. from Patrick. Patrick is always very animated. <laughs> So, so they've, they've they've certainly been stimulated. Um, I don't. I wouldn't say it's necessarily encyclopedic, but um, yeah, I think that um, we even showed parts of of, of the um, the actual documentaries of of you know. AlphaGo and 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 uh, so on. So they've had that stuff. Good. Yeah. So, so let me say a few things based on what you guys have said. Um, today's AI is just just it's just the beginning, but it's a, it tends to be a particular kind. It's like a tool AI, you know, replacing some functions that normally are done by people. And whenever you have replacement, um, there's always this dynamic that that um, there is a concern that, that people's jobs are being lost. Um, but normally the outcome is that uh, people are freed up to do other more interesting jobs and, and people are relieved from, from drudgery and that it's just really, really good. So this is the, you know, this happened with agriculture and this happened with all kinds of uh, physical labor you know, we have machines that will lift things and build buildings for us and, and, and in conjunction with people. Um, it removes though enormous numbers of workers, modern construction technology, modern agricultural technology. And, and yet, um, you know, it's, it's really is just, it's not only good, it's the reason why our world is so uh, effective and so productive and wonderful as it is, why well, our lives are good is because uh, we, people have been freed from doing low value jobs and they've been able to do the higher value jobs. So that's, that's the economy, that's a specialization and exchange and the building of technology. And every time it happens, you know, some people say, oh, we're losing all our jobs, well, we'll have nothing left to do, but you know, look around you, do people have nothing to do? No, they have too much to do. Um, and look around you again at, at all the productivity, how far we've come in the last hundred years. So I expect that sort of to be the same. And that's what's happening now. Um, but we're also looking ahead to the singularity, which is more where we really understand. Um, so maybe I will do a few slides. Uh, if you allow me just to go through them quickly, I won't, I won't go through all the details. Um, let me, uh, uh, share again, and maybe I'd better start up first. Good. And then I can share. This one. Okay, so so 
so um, why is AI exciting? Uh, what's excited about AI? And I, I, because understanding the mind is the greatest scientific challenge and prize of all time. It's a great humanistic endeavor to understand ourselves. And it's not just a technological advance, it's an ability, it's not just an ability to create useful artifacts. It's not just a scientific advance, understanding nature, it's more like I think a step in the development of our planet that we're gonna make people like things and we're gonna be able to change ourselves to be more effective. It's gonna be transformational and yet it's part of what's been happening for thousands if not millions of years. Uh, so it's just this great prize and we should be excited about it. Also because it's happening now for some definition of Moore's law, uh, for some definition of now, because Moore's law means that computational power is dropping. I'm sure you've seen slides like this before pointing out that if you look over the decades, just the last hundred years or so, and we look at how much calculations our computers can do, um, it's, it's continued at least a straight line on a log scale of computer power per dollar. And so computer power is getting more and more uh, inexpensive and more and more plentiful. And this is just a fact about our world. And it's really a, you know, a long running effect of technology. Okay, so this is happening now. It's like a slow explosion that's already begun. And it's always gonna be like this slow explosion. Like right now, you know, oh, computers are getting faster. Each year I get a better phone. Um, it, it will, and yet you have to wait, you know, maybe two years, four years before you get a new phone. And so it seems kind of slow at the same time as it's super fast. I think it will always be exactly like this. It'll be as fast as it is now. You'll have to wait uh, a, a year or two to get a twice as more powerful a machine. Um, so uh, it's also happening here in Canada. Um, it's the home and the birthplace of deep learning, and that's a driver of so much AI. And Canada's also the home of reinforcement learning, which, which might be described as the extension method like deep learning to the larger problems of AI. And it's also happening here, not just in Canada, it's happening at the U of A. U of A has been, uh, people from, from U of A have been parts of many of the great accomplishments. Like AlphaGo, uh, two of the principal most important scientists involved were studied at U of A. And that's true also of the Atari and lots of other work. Uh, oh, here's my, my reinforcement learning and AI group. That's how it was in 2011. And here's where we were a year ago up in CSC. And uh, which was side? Oh, I don't want to introduce myself. Um, but so many of the, the you've, you've heard probably about many of these things, big accomplishments. Um, computers succeeded at Jeopardy. Uh, computers excelled at speech recognition, computer vision, natural language processing. Self-driven cars are, are real, a reality now. The Atari games, I have a slide on the Atari games. So these very diverse games and computers were able to do them back in 2013. And reinforcement learning plus deep learning they will solve all these problems do pretty well. And it was all, the nice thing about it was it was the same algorithm. The same algorithm played all the different games, just had a different experience. Like there were teams of engineers working on each game. There were no engineers working on each game, just, just for the whole set of 49 games. And they learned to play uh, roughly at the level of people or better. And the very same learning algorithm was learned, learned on all these 49 problems. A um, couple other problems, University of Alberta um, solves poker of various forms, um, Michael Bowling, um, beat Minds Alpha Go, beat the world championship earlier this decade, the last decade now. And um, these guys that did Alpha Go, David Silver was my PhD student and Anja Wang was a postdoc uh, also in the computer science department here. Um, in, in DQN, the principal guy did that, did his master's thesis here a few years back under Chaba, Sepish Barring. And Alpha Zero, they carried it, carried it further and they solved all these different games. It's really quite impressive the way it plays chess uh, using no prior knowledge other than the rules of the game. And, and they're doing large language models and Alpha Star and Alpha Fold, the protein folding and the 
the Star Starcraft World of Warcraft player system. Um, so I really think of it as a second industrial revolution. Like the first one was the physical power being replaced by the physical power of machines. And now we have the computational power of people being substituted, being replaced by the computational power of machines. And it's for things, you know, perception, recognizing images, pictures, controlling systems, predicting decision-making, optimization, search. Um, up till now, people have been the cheapest way to do all these things, but now machines are starting to provide cheaper computation in some of these areas. Um, and the big picture, you can think of it as a big, big picture. We started with the Big Bang, getting through the stars, and then we formed life. That was a big event in the development of the universe. And just about now we have, we're switching from life being the only thing that self-replicated things were the most prominent. So should we call this life? Like, you know, you could call that life and you call, could call this machines. But that I don't think it works out that well because, um, you know, nowadays in biology, we think of life as being machines, just a cellular machine, a DNA biological machine. And machines we think are more and more lifelike. So I don't think we want to call one of these life one of these machines. I think we want to call, um, I, want to, I think a good name for, the, for these things uh, is, is are replicators, things that, that, that can make new copies of themselves um, without understanding how they work. Right? So that's what people are. People we can make, we can, you know, we can make new intelligent systems. It just takes, you know, nine months plus, you know, 20 years of development. Uh, whereas what we can't do is we can't design um, better intelligences than, our, than ourselves. Um, but we do do design things that are quite important. Um, like we design those buildings and, and the machines that, we, uh, that do many things. So the age of replicators is that replicated things are the most self-replicated things are the most prominent. So we look around the planet, we will see uh, trees and we will see animals and those are self-replicated things. We also will see buildings and cities, uh, but more, more the, they're run and they're full of uh, self-replicated things. And the age of design, we just can see design things are gonna be most prominent. There, there can be more buildings, there will be more, uh, intelligent machines that will be more prominent in our in the world and so this will this will we're just at the transition now maybe it started with the you could mark the, the start of it the industrial revolution development of technology and computers and so this is a big shift from replicated things to things that can understand themselves well enough to design their replacements and neighbors um, so ai is about intelligent systems trying to design uh, equal or better intelligent systems. And we will succeed. Will, I presume it will be done. Um, let me just go quickly. I'd like to show an example. This is a simple example. This is, this is a, an agent. It is that black square moving around and trying to get to the goal where it gets a reward of plus one. And when it gets to the reward, it, it tries to get back to it. Um, well, it's brought back to the start and it can replot its way, figure out how to get back to a goal. And this is, so this is an elementary learning system, a reinforcement learning system. It can see what state it is. And we're showing in the in green, it shows how good it thinks its state is, like the goal is good. And then things that are close to the goal or that lead to the goal are also good. Things far away are not known to be as good. The arrows show, um, what the behavior of this, what the policy of the system is. You know, if it's here, it's always gonna go down. It doesn't do, it's not such a good thing anymore because we moved the goal. But you see it, its policy changes and, and also the value of these places which used to be really good, they're not just slightly green. And as it spends more time in them, they will be uh, less seen as less good. Eventually it finds the goal and then it fills in that these places are good. If you have the idea. So the goal there, there's, it gets a reward. The reward is, is, uh, is plus one when it gets the goal. It's zero elsewhere. And here we've tucked away the goal and it's kind of a place that's hard to stumble on. It doesn't know the goal has moved except that it's, it went where it used to be and it's no longer there. It no longer gets the plus one. 
and reset at the, at the start. And so it has to um, stumble upon the goal the first time, and then it will fairly efficiently plot its way back to it. So these, these places are getting kind of, you know, there. it's finally got to the goal. And then it's, it's doing a rather fairly sophisticated algorithm that can actually model the world and plan its way. So it planned its way to the goal after the change because it knew which states led to which other state, which cells led to which other cells, which boxes were next to each other. And I'll do that one more time, move it to a new place, has to stumble on it. And then it can plot how to get there. I guess there's just an example of a simple learning goal seeking, goal oriented AI system. And then we're going to challenge it by changing the world in various ways. And it is able to deal with that. Of course, you can't really deal with this. And uh, so it knows these places are good if you could only get back to them, but it can't. So let me ask you, do you feel sorry for the for agent. Anyone feel sorry at all for him? Well, I do. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> um, uh, so this reminds me of um, how any systems can inspire our sympathy if they, they don't really need very, to be very elaborate. It's, anyway, this is my only instance of that. So strong AI, that's when we, this maybe is the singularity, but singularity is kind of a hyperbolic term a little bit. What does it really mean? Uh, it's a way of understanding what's going on. Anyway, it's creating strong AI. It's when people finally come to understand the principles, the principles of intelligence, what it is and how it works well enough to design and create beings as intelligent as, as ourselves. And this is a goal for science, engineering, and the humanities. It's really for all mankind. I'm saying, even though I just earlier said that people, all different agents have different goals and we can, but I think this is a very widely hold, held goal. And it's sort of, uh, that's, that's all I'm saying. That's all you can say about goals. They can be very widely agreed upon. Um, and it's, it's sort of embedded in many of the other things that we've done uh, as we tried to understand ourselves and build more capable systems. Um, but this will also be transformational, it will change everything. Um, eventually being much more powerful than how we are now. Um, so the question is, what do we think about it? And I'm trying to remember what you guys are thinking of it. It's, a, it's, a, it's maybe a useful technology, but it's logical extrapolation is that is that um, un unmodified humans are kind of um, obsolete. Uh, but maybe it's also true that cavemen are obsolete. Uh, and so it's, 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 
it's a natural evolution of the way the world is. And uh, it's something that's happening almost at level two, like the level of biology, the level of the world, the things that will persist, things that are more effective um, are becoming more prominent. Um, so I don't think we're entitled. I don't think we can sit, sit, sit here today and say, we are humans and we are the last humans and no other, there should never be a, a species that surpasses us. And even, even our own endeavors to create machines, those machines can never surpass us. Um, I usually ask people what they think, uh, but I think you've told me roughly what you're thinking. Um, and just to move on, I also mentioned how it will always seem slow. This is really exponential. Exponentials don't change over time. There will be time to deal with it. Um, and I also really strongly feel that if we understand how we work and understand how we think, it's surely going to be good. Um, but just because it's good doesn't mean it won't bring tremendous changes that people will well, at least some people will resist. People who, you know, the famous examples of the buggy whip manufacturers were really disappointed when we figured out to stop, drive, stop riding horses and start, start driving cars. Um, yeah, people will inevitably improve themselves or design improved people. And so ordinary people, as we know them now, um, will become of little importance we're talking about long in the future. I don't think long in the future. Uh, we're talking about the long, long-term consequences. Uh, so I do want to resist the feeling that we are in charge now, and so we should be as we are. We should be in charge, and we are entitled to something. You know, the universe doesn't really care. It doesn't respect our entitlement. Um, we should keep from becoming obsolete by, by making ourselves better. We should prepare for this. We should, how should we think about it? So I'm thinking about people and AIs as being the same or both agents with goals, maybe compatible or conflicting. They may be a little bit different though, you know, people in, in, in China are different from people in North America, except when they come and visit, they're all nice people. And there are all kinds of different people, and yet they're symmetrical and they, they have goals. We shouldn't feel that, that we should be in charge of the machines. We shouldn't feel that we should ensnare them and trap them and, and chain them. Instead, we should treat them more as equals and do what we've always done most productively is work together. Okay, so what I think, I think you, you, you get it. Maybe there are risks ahead, there are risks now. I don't think the risks are particularly due to AI. Most of the risks are due to other people, war, uh, nuclear holocaust, uh, could be diseases. Um, so the societal implications will be, a lot of it will be as we augment ourselves. And I think this is, we can focus on that. It's all good. Um, but, you know, we're gonna wanna be make, make superhuman individuals. And so I fully expect it to happen and I actually believe it will happen within our lifetimes. Um, okay. So what, how can we think about the coming future? I like to think about the coming future. I think that we can uh, influence it, if not design it. We can try to make it better. Uh, but there are real questions. I think that there should be questions in all of our minds. What kind of future do we want? Um, you don't want to freeze time. You don't want to freeze the current state of things. You don't want to control what people work on. Uh, or what people are allowed to think about. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful, interesting 
problem, a, a, the great project of this in any age, which is how to design um, the society we live in. And there's a sense in which AI is like the most human centric of all fields. It's all about us, understanding us, making us, augmenting us. It's not exactly like people, but it's essentially, it's, it's, it's us. It's us, the thinking goal oriented uh, beings that live in and improve this world. Um, so it's all about us. It's all about making our, our lives easier. You know, that's why we have uh, AI on our phones because people will pay to have AI recognize things and do other things to speech recognition. So it's, it's, it's not really essentially techie, alien or artificial. It's, it's more about us making or becoming the next people and next step in the evolution. Uh, the, the thing we, we, we react to, we resist, is this sense that they are, the, the AI would be the other. Uh, you know, what do we do with people that are not like us? When we, whenever we meet them, whenever we meet a new kind of people, we kill them or subjugate them. Or we could, in more enlightened responses, we could trade with them and share with them and even uh, merge their society with ours. You know, that's the basic question, conquer or collaborate. And we really should always attempt collaboration. This is an old, old question. You know, it even goes before humanity. Like, uh, you know, our, our bodies are made of cells and cells used to be independent uh, organisms and they found it better to, to uh, they found it better or they, uh, maybe evolution found it better to make um, organs, organisms have persisted better and, and replicated better if they were made into larger units. And, uh, so you can also think of societies of people or societies of, of insects like the bees or the termites. They have a certain way of behaving that it's good for the niche that they're in. This challenge of the other and how to deal with the other has always been with it, with us. And it's, it's just a new chapter. The singularity is just a new chapter. Just, I shouldn't say just, it's a new chapter. But our goal as this is happening is to, should always be to, seek cooperation rather than domination, evolution and not control. We, you know, you can't, just because you're willing to cooperate doesn't mean that the other person will cooperate, be willing to cooperate, but you have to be open to cooperation. And if you enter the bargaining with the feeling of entitlement that your goals should be primary, uh, you're, 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 you're not going to uh, set yourself up for a good negotiation. Um, and working on the side of co cooperation is that it's, it's rational. It's a powerful universal goal just because specialization and exchange is, is the best strategy, is the most productive strategy. Okay, so I really like thinking about diversity can be good. And one way it can be good is when they overlap, like you might have, uh, we, you might care about your dog and, and so you're caring about your dog means, makes your dog have a certain role in society that's different from the coyote and, and different than uh, an insect. Um, and so, and then because you care about your dog, I have to care about your dog or your neighbor has to care about your dog. You can't just shoot it or, or kill it because you care about it. So this principle, uh, can operate up uh, above us if there are, if, if uh, you're, you're, you're an individual, but you're a member of various groups and you might have, um, uh, so we have super intelligent things like corporations and governments and they, uh, they are not totally free to abuse their, their participants. Um, so there, there's uh, uh, levels. And I want to suggest this would extend to um, a society in which we had intelligences of various levels of ability. And um, the, the, there wouldn't be a single super intelligent AI. Uh, 
and all the rest are people. No, there would be a whole uh, host of different levels of intelligence at different levels. And people could be part of that larger society with cooperation and cooperation all the way down. Um, yeah, so the vision, my vision of the future is we should design and work towards a vibrant, open, resilient society with a multiplicity of designs, multiplicity of cultures and societies and value systems. We should accept different value systems and they, they can compete with each other and cooperate. Um, there may be another society which, which favors more individuality, another society which favors more collective action, one favor that's based on this religion, another that's based on a certain kind of, of, uh, of, of interaction and, and, and support. One, um, I think we should be open-minded about uh, different designs for society. And we, 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 you know, we may be a member of one design and we may be trying to promote wanting that to win, but, but we can't be, uh, so, I, so what, what do I mean by win? Well, winning should be not one society takes over the other. Winning should be one way of being is more successful and, and gains more adherence than the other. So that it can be, it will, your society can win by attracting other people to your society. Okay, and then, yeah. So in this imagined future with, with many diverse societies interacting with different kinds of people, uh, one might forbid uh, intelligent AIs, one might encourage intelligent AIs, one might allow um, mixtures of, of augmented people and, and but not full AIs. Um, there can be all kinds of things and we shouldn't, shouldn't try to pre-establish what are the outcomes going to be. Okay, so I try to hit these points. AI is exciting. It's really a humanistic field, a humanistic field. Understanding mind is a good. I, I don't, it's really just good. Uh, the, there is fear and perils, but it's just the peril of the future and of the other, whenever we have to deal with the other. And, but even that is part of being a vibrant, open, and re resilient society where we don't aggress upon each other. Okay, thank you very much. Great. So, you know, diversity, um, it, there, there have been a number of points in my own career in medicine where I was stuck on a problem and not really seeking out people to ask for help, but I just, I knew that I needed help. And in two or three of those instances, the unique help came from somebody very unlike me, whose goals I didn't really respect. There, there was a guy, the, 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 the high point of his day is when the bus came for him to go back home. <laughs> He was constantly oriented about whether it's time for the bus or not. But I had this problem. I was using a tracer to measure medullary blood flow in the kidney, putting it in through the, you know, arterial route and getting streaming. And, you know, the data was just terrible. And one day this guy so or oriented around when the bus comes, <laughs> why don't you put it in the venous side, allow mixing through the lungs? Probably the transit time through the lungs will be fairly consistent and you'll, you'll get beautiful data. And he was right, <laughs> but nothing else about him changed. He didn't become you know, a, a wonderful human being or, or a model for anybody else, but he gave me the answer that nobody else could. And I, I think this quite frequently happens. You know, I, I've surrounded myself with uh, students, people much younger than me for 49 and a half years now. And, and a lot of my colleagues of my age think, you know, every moment spent with a young person is like completely wasted because I haven't been on earth long enough to know anything important. 
<laughs> but I found exactly the opposite. Time after time, that these young people that I hardly knew with very different life experience from mine gave me an idea that moved everything forward. And, and so, so anyway, yeah. And, and I think it goes beyond humans. As, as you're aware, you know, I've, I've talked about, you know, diversity, the general case saves the human race. And that's the idea of sort of um, including AIs in our circle of empathy. And I don't think that I'm unique. I, I don't think there's anything special about my life where I needed a few dumb, ordinary people every now and then. I think it, it just helps to have diverse, different people around you and to talk to people. Uh, like, uh, you know, they, they, there, there were times like in the office that I'm in now, pre-COVID, when we had as many as seven young people that I was training in the same office where I was working. And a lot of people, particularly in medicine, their idea of success is you have your own office and get better furniture in the corner office and a better view, and that's your life trajectory. Whereas I was sharing this wonderful office one time we had so many students, so we talked about, well, would some of you like to go to some other room? <laughs> Nobody did. So we talked about, well, maybe we could create two layers in here. You know, we could put in some sort of lattice work around so we could have the upper group and lower group. You know, we didn't actually do that, but it, it was super cool how, how they wanted to all stay in that office. And if you look at the period of my career when I was sharing my office with uh, young people, it could just be accidental, but I, I think I was more productive during that period than I was when I had my own solitary office. Just my office, nobody else's office. This is my office. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it must be hard now that we are all locked down. And we're forced to be a bit solitary. Well, but, but I agree with you, yeah, hundred percent about diversity of thought. Yeah. Um, I've I've been impacted many many times by people who thought differently, came outsiders of the field. I really like the outsiders. Yeah, not young people are different from me. Um, they, the the perspective of the young person is is really wonderful because it's. Is sort of unpolluted by by years of experience. <laughs> um, yeah. Maybe they have to, they really have to be even younger than than uh, than you all are, but um, you know, a, a really a young child uh, is absent of so much complication that we all have gotten sure. used to. Uh, no, you know, there, there's something. There are a lot of remarkable things about this particular instance of the course. But one is Kashika S. She isn't here today because she ha has uh, uh, exams, but she lives in uh, India. She's 14. She, she just turned 15 actually yesterday. Um, but so, you know, I'm, I'm doing this world building exercise where you, you answer certain questions and you create your own future reality from 2022 to 2045. Now I've offered the students in this course the opportunity to take part in this, but she's the only one who's actually done it. I'm the only person who's gone through this whole submission of mine and, and gone to all the videos and so on is the only person taking this course who's 14 years old. <laughs> I just think that is so cool. And like she 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 hasn't taken the whole midterm, but she took the space part of the midterm last term, and she did better than all the regular students. There weren't any uh, medical students uh, taking that midterm, but for the regular students, this 14 year old outpaced every other student taking the course. 
<laughs> so it just shows you you can't make any simplistic assumptions you know and then i thought back to what i i was doing when i was 14 and i wrote a poem about it and she was so charming that, that, that i had done that what was i doing when i was 14 i got up early to shovel snow in the winter it's like my first job and i loved with new fallen snow to make the first footprints you know you, you have this beautiful unbroken snow and you're the first person out going off to shovel the one bank in town and the one hardware store it wasn't a very big town and uh yeah so anyway i i think that poem um it's one of the best poems I've written in recent years, and um, it, it, it's partly inspired by this 14-year-old student. Yeah, so there, <laughs> surprising things in the world. Yeah, and the other family who, who isn't here, they're also interesting. One of them is a course alumni, He's somebody who took the course maybe three year, years ago. And, and it, it may seem odd, he was a very dedicated worker and, and, and so on, but he also got the lowest grade in the course, but he didn't care, he was fine with that. So, you know, he, he got, I think a, you know, B and B for him is a good grade, you know, perfectly good grade, but everybody else, but he, he still, he came back and he worked and worked and so on. So now his sister and his cousin are taking the course and they have two younger siblings who also plan to take the course. Yeah, <laughs> just a whole bunch of pageantry going on with this course that you, you would never imagine <laughs> this kind of familial, you know, I'm changing whole families with the course. Who knew? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so other you're fulfilling, you're fulfilling the obligation of the professor, the university professor, to bring in new ideas to the community. Yeah. And exploring them. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, the, the I've gotten fascinated with the idea of the courtyard. They, particularly in, in Eastern thought, that this idea of people meeting in the courtyard and sharing different ideas from different points of view. And the Zoom company, the company that makes the software that we're using right now for this meeting, they're a little bit interested in my idea of, of building three buildings one in Banff, one in Edmonton, and one in uh, Calgary, with, with these courtyards for like, you know, exchanging ideas and mixing young people with older people and even people from the Zoom company. <laughs> so we'll see what happens with that. And, and where, where does that idea come from? In my family, um, my grandfather on my mother's side was the only doctor in Bradford, Vermont for 45 years. So very important in that town. And uh, so they eventually had these three buildings. There was the big house on the hill overlooking the downtown core, but it was a small town. But there, there, there was a walkway, a stone walkway. You could walk directly from the stores in the center of town up to that house where his you know, doctor's office also was. Then they had a cabin in the woods for recreation. And then eventually my grandmother got interested in also having a smaller place for after he retired. So they were called the big house, the little house and the cabin. So what I'm pitching to Zoom now, <laughs> they would create this again for me. They would fund these three buildings in uh, uh, Edmonton, Calgary and, and Banff. 
and you know we produce wonderful things and if you think of what you think of the zoom company i think you you don't currently hold the belief that they're they're sort of have a higher purpose right <laughs> they have a very high purpose for what they're doing maybe they do but we don't we don't know about it and you also don't think of them as a company that's at the technological cutting edge they may be but we're we're not aware of it so that's that's what i'm offering them and we'll see where that pitch goes but it's quite active this particular week i have two uh zoom interactions and and you may be somewhat amused how do they package my input for this pitch for the highest levels of the Zoom company. They take a video, approximately an hour, 56 minutes. Somebody goes through and picks out the Kim Sola's high points. And they put together this seamless video of the high points. So it's exactly 10 minutes. And that's the length of time that, the, that, the, that like the senior people in the company are willing to. And, they, and it's a very good, it's much better Kim Solas than any native Kim Solas. There's a, a bit of hemming and hawing and extra words you don't need and so on. Whereas that distilled 10 minutes is much better than the real me. And, and, and I've never seen anything like that. And there's a toggle switch. So if you want to watch the whole video of me, the whole hour, you can do that. And at any point, if you just want to watch the highlights, you can turn the switch. So I would say that even if nothing happens with this pitch to Zoom, it's still great fun that we're having this interaction. Yeah. So. <laughs> And you may wonder about pictures of the three houses. So the cabins still exist today. And, you know, photography has gotten better and better. And it has a brand new paint job in, in 2022, and it just gleams. So I have a very high resolution picture of the cabin from 2022 that's you know, 11 megabytes, you, you can keep going up and up and see what <laughs> every little brick on, on the chimney and so on looks like. So I'm ho hoping that they will be so impressed by, by that, <laughs> just immediately grant all of our wishes for the three <laughs> buildings built by Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> So how about that, eh? <clears throat> well, it's good. And I want to thank you for asking me to come out today. Certainly. And uh, uh, it's been my pleasure. Yeah, and, and, and ours too. And I think there's a kind of test. So, you know, I, I, I will um, put in some, uh, segmentation in the video so people if they want they, they can just go to your slides but of course if they just start with the slides they miss a, a lot of the, the sort of culture right the, the, the whole you know what is the context right if if they actually watch the whole thing then then they'll get the whole context and they, they may think, oh, I'm very busy. And so I just wa watch the slide. That's okay, but they, they don't really get it all if they just watch the slides. So those of us who are actually here know that secret, you know, that there are two ways to approach this lecture and we know the best way is to watch the whole thing. So anyway, that, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Thank you very much. I, I think the, these, these sessions just get better and better, Rich, and I, I look forward to next term. You know that, that we're doing um, a special version of the course for Nepal. They are creating a new university that's going to try to 
change uh, the Nepalese citizenry so they're more competitive and better at sort of disruptive thinking and, and so on. And so we are helping with that. And so you, you can think about it, but, but you would have the opportunity if, if you want to, it would be much earlier in the day, probably 7.30 in the morning, which is like seven something their time PM. Um, yeah, so you can think about that. You don't, you don't have to, but you could take part of in, in that in the summer. Uh, and, and then of course, there'll, there'll be the fall 2022 version of the course. But anyway, thank you very much for today. Thanks all of you who are participating. And it's, it's kind of interesting, like the 25 medical students, they always have like one or two medical students who are actually here that they can look at this, the, the, you know, on-site instance. So you, like Jessica and uh, Cody are, are representing uh, 25 of their colleagues being here. So, yeah. Okay, well, thank you all very much. And for those students, we'll see you on Thursday. Okay. Bye-bye now.